to uh, give this talk in a different way in terms of saying that I wanted to focus on how I was when I was a teenager and how it shaped me to um, tackle the future uh, challenges, right? So I wanted to show this image. See? This image. Uh, it is said that The Simpsons as a series has the ability to bring the future, right? And why, th why does it happen? It happens because The Simpsons has have created lots of episodes and have created lots of situations, which uh, eventually will converge to some real reality situations, right? And in this case, I wanted to show and talk about MMORPGs, which are RPG games or role-playing games, right? And when I was a teenager, I spent quite a lot of time on this game, Ion. And now I will explain further that. Why I wanted to talk about that in this kind of speech, in this kind of context? Because when I was a teenager, um, I was a guy that I had, let's say, some clear ideas in my mind, right? But uh, I had some maybe pro problems with uh, self-esteem, right? So because of that, I wanted to find, I wanted to develop myself, and I wanted to learn more, but I didn't have the place to do that. So because of that, I went to those kind of games. And those kind of games, the good part or the fun part that they had was that um, you could talk and you could interact with people all around the world. That means that um, I had a, let's say I had a young uh, teenager experience that was, that was uh, quite a bit different because I was able to talk to teenagers. I was able to talk to people in their 20s and their 30s and their 40s. And I had the chance to really understand what was the world about, right? Uh, by using a game, which is quite ironic. So um, in this context, when this, what these games do is essentially they create an environment where, let's say, there are two factions, okay? And these factions confront uh, between each other. They fight among each other, okay? And the idea here is that uh, one faction tries to beat the other one, right? So there's the competition. And inside this, those factions, there was some sort of ranking, right? And in this game, I managed to be the governor, let's say, which was like the top one guy in a server that was uh, of thousands of people, right? So uh, essentially that was me, well, that was my character, right, at that moment. And the fun fact at this point was that those characters or those guys were the privilege to, or had the privilege to transform. And, and you can see here that there are some, quite a lot of names, and these were sieges. These were sieges of some fortresses. In these games, uh, there were some, uh, let's say, there were some fortresses that you, you could capture as a faction, as a race. Right? And in this case, um, those fortresses posed a real challenge to coordinate people and to talk to people and lead people. And uh, at this point, when I was 14 or so, I had to deal and had to live with, like, let's say 300, 400 people and then at the same time to reach to a common objective. So that was something that uh, in a common, let's say, in a common teenager life, that, that, that simply couldn't happen because there was no network, there was no ability, there was no opportunity to do such kind of uh, scaling when leading an initiative or something like that, right? So um, another thing I learned in these kind of games was that there was uh, something called the broker. The broker essentially is a marketplace. So uh, you could see that there were some products in this broker uh, where you could buy and sell and stuff. But there was a point that if you managed to buy everything of a kind of a specific product in broker, right, um, that, would go, that would go out from the broker and essentially prices would rise artificially. So that meant that I kind of understood how economics work. And that was quite important afterwards because I studied a double major in computer science and business. So I had, let's say, uh, some sort of feelings of how everything worked because I had experienced it before. So um, in this kind of games, I always try to uh, look for this graph, right? 
This is the diminishing yield curve graph, which is used in economics, where essentially the idea is the following. First of all, let's imagine that this, um, this line is your happiness, your joy. Yeah, when you are playing this game, right? And um, first of all, when you start playing the game, you you like it, you love it, and you spend some time and you are having fun with it, right? And after that, there's some 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 point, some time that you well, you still have some fun, but it's not the same because you are uh, almost uh, having you are almost uh, giving some effort into playing this game and trying to be the best. Well, in this game in particular, I, I made a calculation as I think I spent like uh, 10,000 hours or so. I was playing for four or five years. So that's quite a lot of time, to be honest. And afterwards, I reached to this point and I was at the point that when I played too much this game, I was like, mm, not maybe obsessed, but I think I, I passed everything I could do in this game. So that was the time I left the game. I was like four or five years after starting with it, right? So, um, why was this important for me? It was important for me because what came afterwards, which, which was the university, it was quite, uh, I found it to be quite similar to the game in terms of, um, I found that lots of things I applied to the game applied to real life. In terms of, um, when I was playing this game, I was kind of the completionist guy, which means that I try to do everything. I try to accomplish everything. So I applied that philosophy to the university. And that led me well, to, uh, to study at all major, um, to know different companies and to try and to work with different startups in terms of cybersecurity, data science, uh, digital marketing, etc., And to have some plan about what I wanted to do. When I was younger, I saw that I was quite capable of leading a uh, huge huge amounts of people let's say huge in terms of three 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 hundred people or more right so i found out that when i was applying those skills at the university it was really easy for me to to talk to students to talk to professors etc because i already had developed these skills before in a different setting additionally uh since i was playing this game in a in a global environment i developed my skill my english skills which, to be honest, in Spain, uh, there's a lot of people that don't really know how to speak English perfectly because the education system is not really good at that point, right? But uh, yeah, the, the main the main takeover and the main take, the main ideas here was that were that essentially what I applied at this game, I could apply uh, and I do apply in my life. So uh, I try to do. Let's say I try to do everything with the passion or I do I do the things I love the most, right? And I try to do the best and then, but always trying to account that, always having to account that I have another life, uh, I have another chance, right? So, uh, and I think this is important because um, at least in Spain, we are told that once you fail, it's quite hard to go back, right? That's kind of the mentality we are instilled in the colleges or in the, in the school, sorry. However, uh, I have found out that myself as an entrepreneur right now, because I am leading a digital transformation company right now, um, I have found out that lots of people are on lots of things, uh, sorry, are essentially by trial or by trying and failing and trying to improve on what, over what you have failed, on, right? And there's no correct solution until you try lots of things and you try and you find something that might be correct. Right? So essentially having that perspective of having played in a game that was kind of some representation of the reality, I'd say, because there was lots of people playing on that on that game. They were different ages, they were from different parts of the world, and they were interacting among each other, sometimes in quite a competitive manner. And that was quite similar to reality. So yeah, um, right now, well, uh, I find that um, as the, the previous speaker was mentioning, it is good to have some experience in huge companies. That's right, because you can you can have some network effect and you can know some other people in the world. But uh, there's also the small company adventure, the entrepreneur adventure, which depending on how you how you are how you behave in the real life in the world it might be more suitable to you 
in my case, I had some interviews with some companies, big uh, consulting companies. And, and to be honest, I never accepted entering on those because I found out to be more comfortable in small companies like cybersecurity companies, which are working with the NATO right now. And I learned quite a lot on those small companies. And I found out that learning those uh, small environments, which were which were scalable, right? Uh, led me to create my own company because I have found the philosophy and the, and a ways to better understand how to do those things and how to use my skills to yeah to do whatever I want. Essentially. So um, right now, and in my point, uh, at this point in my life, uh, in addition to this company which is called Galde. Um, I'm also in the global shippers community, as Marcel uh, mentioned before. And essentially, there we are trying to develop some projects or some social projects that uh, try to help the uh, try to improve the quality of life of uh, people in in our environment. Right. Essentially, I am leading a movement which is uh, in in my region. I am leading a movement which is AI Saturdays, which tries to. Uh, educate people into AI, into artificial intelligence, right? And the philosophy applied there is the same. Try to fail as fast as you can and learn on, on those failings, over those failings, and eventually you will get to something. That's the, that's the main thing I would say. And the second thing I would say is essentially, and that's a question for you guys, uh, whether you love what you are doing right now. If you do, that's awesome. If you don't, just Take a moment to pause and to think and to change and to see whether you can do something that you love. If you just think about it strategically and you try to look at your yourself in the future, like five or ten years or so, you can have, you can do really good decisions because you will do decisions with your mind and your heart essentially. And that's I have found out to be the best way to act. And um, well, that was kind of my monologue. <laughs> I don't know if there's any questions or something like that I wanted to ask, or uh, you wanted to ask, Marcelo. Yeah, the, thanks for that, uh, Benyat. The, um, the curious things that I um, was your age, more or less, when the whole video game industry was being created, right? Uh, not necessarily um, the uh, hyper networked version, but. Um, uh, games that sort of forced you into thinking about uh, boring stuff because it was hidden in all the fun. And this <laughs> is so well aligned to what we're trying to do here. Right? When we have the teenagers joining our sessions in uh, Davos during the World Economic Forum, we uh, get them to do stuff um, in the morning. Uh, the best example is building an igloo. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the thing is that if you tell a teenager, like, tomorrow you have to wake up at 7 in the morning to build an igloo, I am assuming that the answer, and that was definitely the case, um, is going to be, of course, I'll wake up at 7 in the morning to build an igloo. No, two-thirds of them, maybe more, had never seen snow before. There's no, and igloos are symbolic. They've seen in the cartoons, they go like, wow, it's amazing, right? And I can have this experience uh, with my new friends from all around the world. So I don't have to tell them that uh, you must wake up at seven in the morning because there's math class. Mm -hmm. In this case, what we're doing there and kind of uh, being sneaky in um, uh, some interpretations is that we are teaching them about architecture. We're teaching them about Eskimo culture. We're teaching them about thermal insulation. We're teaching them about the production lines and the teamwork because you know, some people have to stomp the snow, some people are going to be cutting the snow, some people are going to be moving it, and then some people are going to be placing it with the expert supervision. So all of a sudden, by building an igloo, they are learning like crazy, and they don't even realize that they're learning because it's not education, it's not structured, it's just a project that you're doing for fun. Right? And I know that is wishful thinking that you can teach everything that must be taught uh, through games. But what you just described is in many ways the best shot we have at creating highly realistic situations that will force the teenagers without them having a problem with it to learn very specific 
um, skills that would be useful in life. And the igloo example is cute and oh yeah, how nice and you know, they're learning how to rescue someone from an avalanche with a dog and it's so interesting and all that. So this is great. I will keep on doing it because it just works. But the one thing that I did with my own daughter, uh, we're planning, uh, well, we're still planning. We want to have a wisdom accelerator for youth, a version which is not in a place. It's flying around the world. So literally would have uh, families that will be joining a round the world trip because there's some low cost airlines. I mean, I hope that they'll come back uh, in the, a few months. Uh, you, you can literally fly around the world for a thousand dollars. That is yeah. not excessive if you consider that you know you'll be learning a lot along the way, especially if it's a you know, fairly structured program as uh, what I have. And uh, we wanted to do a pilot, right? So uh, I I had to go to lots of places around the world for another community that I'm building in the blockchain space. I was still have it, but. Um, the idea back then was to host uh, events uh, in uh, many countries. And uh, I thought it would be great to have my daughter uh, joining me you know, so that she could fly around the world and get to see amazing places. And also so that she could criticize and uh, give feedback saying, oh, this place is boring or no, this thing was great. And I wanted her to be part of the planning. Right? So she was staying with me. Uh, she lives no, in Denmark, I'm in Switzerland, so she was in Switzerland at that time. And it's a nice sunny day, let's get a flip chart outside in the garden and uh, let's teach her some linear programming. Now, if you go to a 15 year old and say, would you like to learn linear programming? The answer is likely to be no. It's like, why should I care? I didn't say that. What I said is, we're flying around the world, but with low cost airlines, we have many options. So we need to figure out if you're flying from A back to A, but you have uh, almost total flexibility in terms of um, how and which days, there are limitations in terms of which airlines are offering which you know, services between cities, which days of the week and how much do they cost. So there are lots of constraints. Right? And uh, what I was asking her to do is just to go to uh, Sky Scanner, the app, and say, look, no, we, we have a couple of constraints that are pretty obvious. If you want to fly across the Pacific Ocean, you pretty much have to go to Hawaii. But then again, why wouldn't you want to go to Hawaii right, if you have the chance to go there? So Honolulu is one of the fixed points. Um, California makes sense because I have so many low-cost flights from San Francisco and Los Angeles. So I need to figure out a way to get to California. And then once you go, um, you're in uh, Hawaii, the cheapest place uh, to go forwards will be Japan because so many Japanese people love getting married in Hawaii. So there's a huge number of airlines flying there for a very low cost. So all of a sudden, she was there for an hour trying to figure out the cheapest dates, what are, you know, the flight time and everything else. She spent an hour studying linear programming. But no, it was expressed to her as we're planning a round the world trip. And I told her later that she was learning linear programming. And then she was like, oh, cool. No, nope. back to work, right? So glad that it happened. But just imagine if I had tried to force her to study maths and you, know, you need to have all of those elements before and you have to pass this exam. So the one thing that I would love to see and have, uh, love to have your opinion on that, I'd love to see more uh, games that actually uh, allow teenagers, children even, to learn uh, while having fun. And I know that many of them are claiming to do that. I would like to hear your expert opinion on how many are actually no, uh, making them wiser, and um, uh, how can we have more of those in the future? Yeah, well, I in in my case, I mean, I think I learned quite a lot of this game uh, about this game uh, from this game because I essentially tried to get the maximum out of it because I wanted to be the leader in those terms. So that forced me to lead, like I said mentioned before, like three hundred people or so when leading uh, uh, sieges on fortresses and such. If, if I was a casual player, maybe I wouldn't have had so much learnings, right? But I know this was a setting where, as you mentioned, right, in terms of achieving some other goals, 
I developed some of the skills which proved to be useful later on. And if, which skills do you think that the, the most useful, relevant that you've learned that uh, you think that could be improved? I, I, I would mention, first of all, leadership, because after leading 300 people, I was not afraid to, <laughs> I'm not afraid to lead um, some people and on different settings, right? Uh, Let's stop there for a second. Right? Leadership uh, goes far beyond uh, leading people online. Uh, leadership is about empathic. You you pay attention to the expression on the faces. They're sad. Then you say, "Oh, I'm not going to ask him to stay for you no know, overtime." So uh, I, I think that the trick, and I'm I'm agreeing with you here, is that you lost your fear to be a leader. Okay. And then it was so much easier to do everything else you had to learn as a leader because you're not afraid to get started in the first place. That's it. So, well, uh, out of leading those people, right, I had to communicate with them. I had to tell them some sort of a strategy to work, to try to capture these portraits, right? Because sometimes we were outnumbered. Like we were 300 people, but the other side, I like, had like 500 people or so. So we had to think about, uh, well, I had to think about those uh, attacks and strategy, right? And yes, yeah, so because of that, I had to communicate with lots of people. And I sometimes we, we were video chatting or we were chatting online. So I think I could have some ideas of the feelings of what people were thinking, what people were doing right now. I mean, I, I think it's not the same as we have lived right now with the pandemic. It's not the same as having uh, physical contact, right? But I had some cues and some ideas on how to lead those people in that aspect. Uh, some some additional things I learned. I learned how economics work, basically. So after that, that proved very really useful for me for my studies and when I was studying business. Because um, when, I was, when we were talking about economics and such, it was really intuitive for me. Because uh, essentially, I lived that in, that in my... <laughs> In my own experience, so I I knew what what inflation meant. I knew what uh, monopolies meant and such, right? And um, some other things. I also learned how to express myself in English because I had some issues before. But having exposed and uh, being exposed to to so much people all around the world from different countries, I was forced to talk to English, right? So and I tried to do it in a proper manner, not. Uh, not in a structure, in an structured manner, right? So I think I also learned about that, and there were some other, some other takeovers, uh, some other ideas, some other learnings too, right? But I think that would that those would be the main ideas saying I brought from that game, to be honest. All right, uh, maybe I should introduce you uh, to uh, one of the first speakers here at the Wisdom Accelerator. He's doing games um, okay. or education right so um, it's um, i don't know if it's a potential collaboration but uh, i'll check with him if you he'll like to have an intro and of course the idea is to make sure that uh, everybody who's participating in a way uh, gets value from the experience so we'll be happy to to do the intro and he's based in new york uh, mm -hmm. and um, he's been very successful you know, designing games uh, that are specifically focused on the, the learning element mm -hmm. Thank you very much. I think that will be interesting. Thanks. Oh, excellent. So we already have our next speaker here. Uh, but Benya, thank you so much for sharing. I think that uh, this is a great topic. Uh, we should be looking more into how to kind of uh, not reform games, but just sort of change the image that games are a waste of time, which uh, older people tend to have, um, and um, come up with better examples. I guess you know, games like SimCity have been around for long enough for even older people to go like, yeah, not all games are just point and shoot. Uh, but you know, what you're sharing here is that even the point and shoot games, they can teach you amazing things, right? So, which is uh, not the case a couple of uh, generations ago with um, the likes of Doom and Wolfenstein, which is basically you know, just to get the rage and the anger out of the system uh, without causing harm to society. But uh, it, it's great to know uh, how much has evolved and the fact that uh, you're in a position now to teach others you know, uh, what they can benefit um, when uh, they uh, get involved as well. So. well thank, thank you very much, Marcel. <laughs>